Good morning and, and welcome to the inaugural, our first Path Essay Symposium 2022. Um, thank you for taking the time to attend it. And um, my name is Mershon Pele. I've been part of the organizing committee uh, who will introduce at the end. And um, we've put together a program that we think is going to be really enjoyable. Um, you know, this being the first symposium um, has several implications for the, um, the way in which uh, gender affirmation healthcare may be developed in, in South Africa. And we, we really have a vested interest in looking and learning from the people who have, uh, who will be presenting their work, their reflections and their research. Um, and we encourage all of you to engage each other during, during the course of the, the morning. And without further ado, I'm going to hand you over to um, the, our, our uh, Secretary of Path SA, who uh, will be introducing our keynote speaker, Alma. Good morning, everyone. I am so excited. Um, Path SA is now two years old. And it's wonderful that, that we can have our first, first academic symposium and share about what is happening in, in this field. And we are very fortunate to have a wonderful keynote speaker, Landa Mabenge. Landa is an author who has wrote a book, Becoming Him, a trans memoir of triumph that came out in 2018. He's also written chapters and other books. Um, yeah, he's done an honors and art and arts and MA in sociology and he's currently a PhD candidate at UCT and maybe Landa you can tell us a little bit more about yourself but yeah we, we're delighted that you're going to share with us today. Over to Landa. Thank you, Thank you so much Alma. Hi everyone good morning. Um, happy Saturday. My apologies for the headphones. I was trying to pull off a look here but now I have to wear these because they help with um, clearer sound. Uh, like Alma has introduced, I am Landa Mabenge. Um, I am the author of Becoming Him. I am currently based in Cape Town, um, where I do a couple of things. I've got an independent consultancy, um, Landa Mabenge Consulting. Uh, this stems from the work that I do um, in terms of the education space. Uh, to create awareness, um, to educate on what it means to be transgender and gender diverse um, in South Africa. Um, I myself come in lived experience. I uh, have, have had to negotiate access into healthcare spaces, uh, mostly uh, in terms of seeking linkages to care, uh, which was um, done successfully um, in 20, 2007, where I met Ron. So it's always good to see Ron as part of any audience um, or space that I am invited into. Uh, Ron was the first person I actually had a frank conversation with about who I was and who I felt I was becoming. And Ron created that sort of safety net and subsequently linked me to the Transgender Clinic at Fritches Care Hospital, where I've, I'm still a patient. and. Um, where I'm still receiving uh, much needed care. I'm then also doing my PhD, like Alma said, at the UCT School of Public Health. Um, I'm trained in sociology. I hold a master's from the University of Sussex. And I'm bringing that to public health because I'm very, very passionate about inclusive primary health care spaces. And um, that is the work that I'm currently, the research that I'm, I'm trying to sort of focus on primarily at uh, communities that are university clinics in South Africa, we've got 26 public universities. And so my work is really focused and centered them. Um, and thank you for this invitation. I really appreciate this. And I hope I will do justice um, to, to sort of make sure that I, I meet, um, yeah, I meet the invitation and I do justice to it. So I've, I thought about this this um, topic and I, I thought it's very important, you know, it's it, and I think a lot of people um, who are attending this, this symposium today will agree that this is really something that uh, a lot of healthcare workers, a lot of providers, a lot of educators who have been interested in inclusive interventions for, um, you know, trans and gender diverse um, populations, 
will agree that this is what this is what the work needs to look like or work or, or, or sort of be steered towards these collaborations in the professional space and also the education. So perhaps to take a step back, just to talk briefly about myself, because that's a key part of what we're trying to achieve here. Um, when one is able to be visible as a lived experience, it, I think it goes a long way in terms of shifting the narrative and also creating spaces for dialogue. Um, I always say that human beings uh, in our selectiveness, until we can sometimes see what it looks like to be um, part of a certain population, it kind of like lowers inhibitions and makes it easier to want to relate and, and engage and try and understand. So for me, that, that is what the work that I do is. But briefly about myself, I was born like everyone else here, I will assume. Uh, I didn't drop from the sky. I wasn't carried by a stalk to my family's doorstep. I was born, I was assigned female at birth. Um, and two days later, I was I was born in Gabeha, which is formerly known as PE, where Alma is. And then two days later, I was in Umtata with my maternal family, grew up in a very warm, loving environment, um, and mostly under the tutorship of my grandparents, my maternal grandparents and my maternal aunt. And then fast forward a couple of years later, at 11, I, I then was ferried back to Gabeha to live with my biological parents. Um, and I mean, at the time I was a developing young person. So my body was moving one way, my mind was moving another way. I wasn't finding rapport with the intersectional parts of who I was. I didn't have the language. And so I spent a lot of time just existing in silos inside my head. And, um, and so it was only then after I'd left Babeja um, um, to come and study at the UCT in 2000 as an undergrad, um, where I started flirting with the reality that I may not fit neatly into the box that I was shoved into at birth. So in other words, I, I did not neatly tick that pink box. It didn't make sense to me. I could not relate to its fullness. And um, so I started sort of, you know, working towards finding spaces where I could have those conversations. And at the time, the safest space was student wellness where I saw um, a psychologist um, on campus, um, Diego Schreiber, who has her own chapter in that book. And, you know, we started peeling back the layers of various struggles that I'd carried as a human being, but also tapped into the idea that I wasn't, you know, feeling aligned, I wasn't feeling, you know, um, centered in who I was and who I was becoming. There was this disconnect. And one thing that always stands out for me um, in terms of those conversations, those early conversations with Vegas, was that these were the early 2000s, was that even though they themselves did not have the language or, or comprehension of what I was saying, they did not shut uh, that door in my face. They did not sort of minimize what I was trying to convey to them. The conversation shifted uh, to, I don't have the language for this lander, but maybe we can try and figure it out. But right now, let's work on your immediate need, and then eventually we'll get to where we need to get to. And for me, that always stands out because that has been my experience in, in many healthcare spaces subsequently, where I have had to negotiate access to find myself, to seek um, knowledgeable practitioners. And in my case, I was very, very fortunate to find someone like Ron off the bat, who was, who had the knowledge, who had the acumen, and who had the skill set to refer me to this broader uh, sort of clinical um, space and multidisciplinary team that was able to then tailor uh, to my needs and, and my journey towards my becoming. So then going back to tie it to why the need for this um, interprofessional sort of um, approach to education, um, to collaboration in terms of gender and feminine healthcare, the reality is that um, as human beings, we all carry multiple facets to who we are. We are not just service anatomy. And I think that is the, the crux of, of what restricts these, these education initiatives and the willingness uh, for, for healthcare providers and educators to say, let's come together, let's try and find uh, and mediate solutions towards this. And these missed opportunities then will then start on the home level. Right, because at a primary level, 
we don't have language, we don't have inclusive spaces, we don't have the understandings um, from primary providers in terms of what it means to be trans or gender diverse. So those are key collaborators. And I think it would be very, very crucial to find ways to, to filter down these conversations and to find linkages to those charged with the primary care of young people who are then going to evolve and emerge and figure out themselves in terms of who they are and who they are becoming. So that's the first space where I feel is a missed opportunity. And secondly, we've got our schooling system. I mean, all of us at some point would have to go to school. We don't have a choice. Whether we kick or scream or throw our toys out the cart, school is a thing. We, we must go to school. And, and school becomes a very sort of important arena that is going to shape how young people interact and engage with the world. And I think for me there, we're looking at secondary schooling, and I know Ron does a lot of work in the secondary schooling space already. Um, and I think that that is where we then need to look and shift the lens towards inclusive um, life orientation curricula, spaces where collaborations can be had with uh, those charged with our education in those spaces, because they are the ones who are now allowing a wider birth in terms of young people asserting themselves. Then university, a very crucial and critical space because at that time, we've got young adults who are emerging as autonomous beings who are now able to try and find the language to assert themselves better. And so we have existing wellness clinics, we have existing uh, facilities in our campuses uh, which can provide a very important first entry into the primary healthcare space as autonomous agents, as autonomous beings, where young people are getting into these spaces on their own, without their community, without their parents, where they are assuming responsibility for their health. But if they get into these spaces and there are these systematic and structural barriers, which have, I mean, research has shown that that, that is what happens. Uh, those are the exclusions, that's the bulk of the exclusions. Uh, and add to that personal convictions from healthcare providers who are going to foreground themselves as moral authority and say, you cannot do this, you cannot align your body with your, with your identity, you cannot take any hormones that are going to allow you to journey towards your becoming because sex and gender is interchangeable and that's the end of the story. So that's a very big gap. That's a very big, a big missed opportunity. And that's where the bulk of my research focus lies currently where I seek to argue that because primary um, clinics in the university setting are community-centric clinics, right? And if we, if we journey into uh, the Palela community-centric uh, approach to primary health care, then that community should be able to meet the diverse needs of all of the sort of uh, key players, which are the community members, which are the various uh, populations in that community to tailor a solution that says, what are the needs of these communities? What are the population sets in these communities? And how do we then craft a response to that in terms of inclusive practices in this primary healthcare space. And so I think within that space, then if we look at the psychosocial arm, on the one hand, we've depathologized, um, or ICD-11 depathologizes uh, trans and gender diverse identities to, 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 and, and removes that classification and puts it in the chapter of conditions related to sexual health. So what does sexual health look like at a primary level? Sexual health at a primary level looks like access to gender affirming healthcare. And for trans and gender diverse human beings, that is psychosocial basic counseling, number one. And number two, it's primary gender affirming healthcare interventions in the form of um, hormones, um, testosterone, oestrogen, and, and that should be part of the package of care that is linked to sex and reproductive uh, con consumables. Fortunately, at tertiary level, these are already part of the essential medicines list. So I think there's a lot of um, opportunities. There are a lot of gaps currently in terms of literature because this population set is very under-researched. Um, there's not enough sort of research to show the, the, the gaps 
um, it's it, in, in a South African context, it is still very much located uh, in, in, in the academic sort of specialized professions, your, 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 your medical professionals who are willing to learn, who are willing to move outside their scope of comfort to say, but this is part of, of, of what I signed up for when I wanted to be a medical doctor uh, in terms of uh, linkages to care. Um, but now a lot of this work has been done by civic society organizations. That's where the, the, the basis of it has been in this country, in a country where the constitution is very affirming, is very clear. On, on inclusive practices um, and, and the right to non-discrimination to, to healthcare access, which currently doesn't work. So how then do we leverage existing um, sort of bodies, organizations to try and, and work with professional spaces um, to, to try and build sort of a curriculum that could be included in the health sciences? I know Alma has written about this a lot. Um, why don't we have? Uh, an inclusive health sciences curricula in a country that has got clear a clear human rights uh, a framework. So I think um, for the most part, um, that is what is needed. There are multiple layers to this. I always lean into the uh, framework of intersectionality, which should, I argue, not just focus on the struggles that we carry as people, very, very important, but also the privileges that we carry and how we can use those to negotiate uh, spaces to negotiate uh, linkages in terms of education initiatives, uh, collaborations. Um, I myself, through my consultancy, have found great value in collaborating with people like Ronald uh, and Alma, professionals in the healthcare space, who are willing to then foster those, those relationships and say, this is where we are, how do we move forward, how do we tailor solutions to a clearly diverse human population as it is, and how do we then find these linkages for this demographic or this population group, which is currently being subjected to violations from a structural systematic uh, lens from healthcare professionals who may or may not um, seek to, to gain uh, an understanding or who may or may not be willing to, to provide this, this much needed and critical care? And how do we also leverage on, on trans and gender diverse um, individuals who are willing to, to, to locate themselves and position themselves as part of this education narrative to show that it's, it's a healthy approach to, to a diverse lived experience, to a human being who is seeking interventions to align at, at themselves in any space, in any way, whatever that looks like for them. So I think um, the danger of not having uh, interprofessional collaborations, the danger of not having education initiatives um, in these spaces is that we, con we then re-traumatize and re-victimize and, and, and re-endanger an already marginalized and, and, and rejected uh, population group. And so I think it becomes important to then look at the various layers where contributions can, make, can be made and look at, at possible ways of expanding the existing research to say, if we're looking at models of collaboration and interprofessional education, what should these look like? Who are the population groups that we need to, to sort of involve in, as participants in these studies? And I think a lot of value could be gained by looking at the professionals themselves, the healthcare providers in all of their different sort of um, locations, your, your, your primary healthcare nurses, your, your medical doctors, your students who are currently at, at medical schools, and, and look at how um, the design of an inclusive approach um, can, can be sort of interrogated from a research perspective so that recommendations can actually fuel and feed uh, tangible interventions in the form of inclusive curricula, in the form of inclusive dialogues and inclusive care at critical sort of primary healthcare facilities so that these population groups don't have to rely on tertiary sort of spaces to seek their care. So I think um, that captures the bulk of what I wanted to say. I am happy to, I don't know how this normally works, uh, Alma, but I am happy to sort of take questions if, if, if those are permissible to probably further explore uh, what else can be um, 
interrogated in terms of coming up with solutions. I have had a look at a lot of the sort of abstract titles and they all seem to feed into the bigger need uh, of actually establishing a landscape in terms of what this demographic actually looks like, where they are located, what the experiences are in terms of a gender affirming healthcare approach, which I think if we look at gender affirming healthcare, anyone who enters a, a healthcare system, their gender needs to be affirmed. So it's not even limited to trans or gender diverse human beings. Any entrant into a healthcare system, they need to be affirmed in terms of their gender. And currently we have um, sort of um, policies, we've got frameworks, we've got practices that affirm some and not all. And I think when, when tailoring these, these collaborations, we need to not look at the sort of special needs of the trans and gender diverse community. We look at this population as a, a population which is part of the general population, which needs to be affirmed on entry to the healthcare system and what their needs look like, just speak to inclusive psychosocial and hormone therapy interventions. So I think, I think that is what is going to be very important. At some point, it needs to filter down to the primary home level, and it needs to be interrogated there in terms of roping in the primary health care, the primary give the primary caregivers at that level so that we can establish a clear thread uh, from that level up until to self-assertion level where an individual enters the healthcare system on their own and does not have to be subjected to violations, does not have to be subjected to exclusions because we do not have a sufficiently aware, educated and willing healthcare provider workforce across all spectrums of those spaces. So yeah, I think that's where I can pause for now and leave it for now and um, throw it back to you, Alma. Thank you, Londa, that, that was amazing. Um, you touched on so many important things that, that are part of this, this conversation. I, I think we're a bunch of dreamers mm. who, who dream of this world where all trans and gender diverse people will get the care that they need, mm. will be affirmed and will be welcome. And there, there's such a long way to go, but you've, you've touched on the importance of schools, student health, the role of NPOs, um, that we need to mainstream, yes. that it, it can't remain just the tertiary care. And if you look nationally, you know, it, it's not even tertiary care in every province. Yeah, it's um, a select, it's yeah, less than five. You've, you, you mentioned the importance of research and we've got some researchers in the room today and that that's wonderful. And <laughs> uh, I had to chuckle when you said, you don't know what normally happens now, you know that <laughs> normal <laughs> yeah. is a, a, a problematic word. So this is our first ever symposium. Mm. So to, to say what usually happens um, with, with our CPD talks is that there is time for people to ask questions. And if mm. we, um, let's see, are there any hands now? Mm. Yes, Madeleine's got a hand. Over to you, Madeline. I'm happy to wait till the end, or I don't know, yeah, again, depending on the structure of your morning, I don't have a timetable in front of me. Okay, so we, we will share the timetable, but please go now, Madeleine. Hi, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Dr. Madeleine Muller. I'm a senior lecturer with WUSU, very passionate about education, working in family medicine at a regional hospital here in East London. Uh, so this is a conversation I've had with Alma, <laughs> and it seems like the right place to bring it up. Um, and it's, it's more the strategic side of things in terms of this question of how do we um, create it as part of our sort of uh, curriculum or part of our training of all primary healthcare nurses should be able to be trained up on gender affirming healthcare and should be part of the primary healthcare package. Um, and we've been in a process and uh, the HIV Clinician Society and PATH SA has made amazing progress because we've got this amazing guideline it's in the tertiary eml as we've, we've already could put things in place but none of it is actually getting us closer to getting it into primary health care um and those that's been involved especially in the ngo sector trying to engage with it on primary health care know that we keep on stumbling um and we're not going to win until we find it it needs a home at the moment gender affirming health care does not have a place really um because traditionally and from 
you don't have to go into the history, but it's still seen in terms of medical care that this belongs to endocrinology. And so it's always been housed under the endocrinological branch and it should be looked after by endocrinologists who are specialized in gender affirming healthcare. So it's a super specialized field. And in the challenges, therefore, it's end up just sitting in tertiary facilities and it's now in our tertiary EML. Um, and the guideline is amazing because it takes the focus from now, actually the point of this program is to provide access to primary health care. That's the whole point is partly to, to create a more an accessible health healthcare service for our population. So um, I have a, a proposal and we are at the beginning of planting seeds. I've started chatting to various people. This is a long, long term view. Um, is that we need to find a different housing for it. And within housing, I mean within our medical textbooks and within our medical thinking. Um, and that is because we want it to sit within primary health care. And the obvious place to put it is under sexual health. It sounds obvious, but in the world of medicine, you're not going to go and find this topic under the sexual health section. And sexual health classically falls under family medicine. So again, this is all about what we have always done. And family medicine has not traditionally looked after this as one of the topics in their in their um, academic field. And so therefore it's not necessarily going to be an easy task on how to introduce that as an academic to topic. We're doing something that is, well, out of the box as it should be. Um, but for me, that is maybe where we need to really start thinking and saying, hold on and keep on, instead of trying to push it into this endocrinology and how do we make this endocrinological thing sit in primary health care, it needs to actually become a subsection of the sexual health field we have to talk to the academics that works within the sexual health field. Um, and then it becomes one of the sections of sexual health. So when you do your sexual health diploma, which I think is already in there um, because we've got good people that has helped set up the sexual health diploma for doctors, for example, gender affirming healthcare is part of that. Um, and then when we then start doing all our meetings with government about getting it into primary health care, we can also say, well, it belongs to sexual health, it belongs to family medicine. And then it's just one small step on adding it to a primary health care um, EML or whatever. But as long as it belongs to endocrinology, we it's, it's, yeah, we're just gonna go around and run and run and run around in circles. So that's just a little thought for the future from my side. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, no, that's a great thought. And you're very, like, you nail on the head. And I think, like, we can all agree here, it's it's not going to be an overnight um, sort of, the change is not going to come, come overnight, unfortunately, uh, especially when you're dealing with, which is unfortunate because you're dealing with people's lives here and uh, people's uh, need for, for, for accessible interventions. And you're right, I mean, endocrinology is, is specialized. And so, it it removes, but I think this is this is this is like part of this intervention, right? This is the whole point of having this this symposium and these conversations and these building of these networks and collaborations on this level, even. And um, a big part of that then will will steer the the manner in which um, this work gets done and the shifting of where this case located gets done. I mean, I remember sp speaking to Alma when, when we were talking about my PhD and, and what, what I'm trying to achieve. Um, for me, it makes sense in trying to find a home and house to find primary accessible spaces, especially if we now have a long-term view and look at where this country's healthcare sort of model is moving towards in terms of national health, if that ever happens or not. But I mean that the frameworks are being put in place, the, the, the conversations are happening. And so if, if we're looking to redefine communities and look at what we term as a community, then various pockets of communities are going to be conducive spaces. To, to, to be able to, to, to house this care as a primary intervention and not at a tertiary endocrinological, le, endocrinological level, sorry, English on Saturday, level, um, like you say, which, which is very, very inaccessible. So I think um, a big part of it is, is perhaps the clinicians, the doctors um, themselves need to interrogate further because well, they've got the, the language the language My, of 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 way yeah, of, of medicine and and clinical yes, so, elements and and interactions so that that's where the value comes in. But you're definitely right. Easier. It needs 
I think Wendy's unmuted um, and perhaps they're trying to say something. But I think, uh, Madeline, long and short of it, you're right. It needs to be shifted. It needs to be more accessible. That is the whole point of having such conversations, of having such dialogues. And I understand that at the university campus, it's, it's still quite a niche uh, uh, um, community, right? Not everyone gets into university, but it's another layer of, 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 of accessing it at a primary entry level. Um, and I think that becomes that becomes very crucial and very important. But thank you for 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 sharing that and 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 sharing us that long term view in terms of what you're working on. Here, go for it. Thank you, Elma, and hi, Linda. Um, I, I, the question I wanted to raise, uh, perhaps I don't even know if it's a question or a comment, is, is, is sort of about the school space. And I know there are people in this meeting who've done a lot of work and may have some thoughts. Um, a, a colleague of mine was invited to run a session on gender at a sort of private school in Joburg. Um, under this umbrella of life orientation. And, and I gather that this person has brought my colleague in because they're feeling a bit desperate because there's such resistance in the school to anything that, that is, um, uh, steers away from sort of a particular orthodox view of human beings and sexualities and gender. Um, so for example, um, when, when the school talked about introducing different uniform options or, or or some gender neutral bathrooms some parents threatened to withdraw their children from the school um, and when they heard that there was going to be an assembly which may be talked on about gay pride for example or something that was vaguely affirming parents said that's fine but I'll just not allow my child to go to school that day so and I think in, in the private school space, what is in, that there's a kind of leverage that parents have there because the school needs the funding. They need parents to pay their fees. And the threat to withdraw their children has a knock-on effect, of course, on the school's functioning. So, I mean, I don't think there's a simple solution to this, but, but I suppose what I'm so, so feeling, there's a kind of resistance that is being expressed by parents that is difficult to address. Um, even attempts by schools to reach out to those parents can fail. Um, and is there, you know, I sort of have this idea that we need to be doing, we, there's, there's a opportunities to, sh to shift or shape the debate that, that are being missed around schooling and parenting and what kind of world as, as a parent, you're preparing your child for. So that's a bit of a ramble question, but I just wondered if you have any reflections on that or anybody else in the room maybe does too. Thanks. Thanks, Pia. Um, I don't want to pick on Ronald because he, he does excellent work in this space. But I think just to, like I said, you, you raise a very valid question. Um, and you raise a very, a very valid point about how those charged with the, you know, primary care of these young people are the ones who are closing off opportunities to learn. And I'm wondering perhaps if then that doesn't provide an opportunity for the actual educators. Um, and I know that there could be resistance, big resistance from that perspective as well, right? But the, the, the benefit of sort of targeting educators more would then be from the responsibility that comes with the profession in terms of a set curriculum, an inclusive curriculum, which then brings us back to perhaps a similar position with what currently exists or doesn't in the health sciences at the tertiary level of education, where the curriculum in and of itself does not prepare the doctors or the healthcare providers and healthcare workers for what needs to happen when um, engaging into action and treating trans and gender diverse patients, which then spills back to the very rigid binary heteronormative 
model of how we live our lives, which is very destructive. But to kind of like bite this or, or to eat this elephant, perhaps a bite at a size would be to, to zoom into one element of this population set that could be given the tools as part of um, you know, a curriculum that is that is going to require the, this collaboration at this level, and especially with, with um, uh, NPOs, which have been doing great work at, at creating manuals, at creating and then engaging governments to, to rework and re redefine what should be part, what should be taught as part of the school. Perhaps if it's part of that, um, it could go some way at shifting the narrative, but it's going to be a very slow, painful and, and, and very long process, I assume. And I think Ron being the expert and his hand was up, I'll hand over to you, Ron. Thank you, Thank you Landa. Your, my ego is so stroked this morning, so I just want to land. So thank you. I get very anxious with that word expert. For me, the word expert means he's just lang and he tant has for a very long time stuck around in a space. And that's that's as, as far as I'm willing to go. Um, but just uh, just to, to link to what Pierre was asking and what came to mind, my, the first thought that came to mind and also linked to what um, you and and Landa, you and, and um, uh, no, I've just got my brain just gone, Madeleine were talking about earlier was about location. So um, where is the work or where is gender affirming healthcare located within systems? Um, so with the work that I've been doing in schools for a number of years, um, there's very much this perception that, you know, so when it comes to gender affirming healthcare, it's located within life orientation and then the life orientation curriculum. And I've worked very, very hard to not situate it there, that the life orientation, um, you know, um, curriculum is a component of the work that um, is done in, in the school environment. So I very quickly, when I'm involved with the school environment, um, situate the work within the management of the school. Um, and I, I, very, I spend a lot of time meeting with the principal, the school management, the governing body elements, the, the people that have the power. Um, and the work that needs to happen there is, is, is bringing the people that have the power on board and, and to kind of say, it's kind of, they almost need to understand the, it's like, it's more than trans 101, that we need to get that in there. But then it's that helping the, 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 the system elements that have the power to kind of like, what is your ethos? What are the principles that inform the type of school that you are managing? You know, do you, um, and, and I, I find I need to do, I, I do a lot of work around that around. So what is your school's ethos? What is your school's principles? Is inclusivity and diversity, um, you know, important to you as a school? Is that reflected in your, in your school values and and and? And I find I, that's one important area of work that needs to happen. Um, and if you then get the school management to make that mind shift, then when they get pushback from parents, um, their ability to kind of navigate that is that they then get called on, you know, are you now going to just say we're an inclusive school or do you mean you're an inclusive school? Um, and then what is that, what responsibility does that put on your shoulders then as, you know, the, um, the management of a school? Uh, and then obviously then we obviously are, offer the support. I mean, I'm, I'm often sitting with, with school management teams and then strategizing. So how do we bring the parents in? How do we engage the learners? Um, sometimes I deal with schools where the governing body is at odds with the, with the school management. Um, but I, you can only get to the strategizing place once you have the, the mindset and the, the clarity of intention, principles, and values in place. Sorry, that's just my ramble. Thanks, Pierre. You got me triggered this morning. <laughs> Landa, do you want to respond to that or can we go to Georgia? I think I think we can go to Georgia. I think Ron has hit the nail on the head. Again, the question about location, right? And and where 
the critical tools of, of engagement need to be located uh, to shift um, the lens and to, yeah, to get the mechanics going. So I think we can go to Georgia, thanks, Alma. Um, good morning. Thank you so much for the opportunity um, to be here. It's very exciting for me. Um, I am a public health student currently. Um, so, and I'm also, why I'm so interested in this is because um, I am dating a, um, a I'm like trans woman. So this is very near and dear to my heart. But um, I've learned a lot in my degree so far that it goes beyond clinical. Um, the one-on-one -on -one situation between patient and provider only goes so far. So we need to educate and we need to promote this, this like message on a community, on a population level. And I wanted to ask you how, um, how I, as, as a future public health specialist can do that um, and what you think needs, needs to be done in terms of policy, in terms of health education and all of all of those different variables that I think are very important when it comes to dealing with this um, uh, dealing with this topic in a very holistic sort of way. Thank you for that question, Georgia. I would encourage you to read some of the work that was written by Alma de Vries on this and others in terms of an inclusive um, approach in terms of the curriculum, the existing curriculum. But you're right, the, the one-on-one -on -one is, is it may not seem like the most critical, but to a trans and gender diverse um, sort of individual who is seeking um, an alignment uh, within the, the, the healthcare space, it is very crucial. And I mean, I'm speaking from, from a lived experience and I'm speaking from an experience where I work a lot with, with trans and gender diverse um, young people. Um, I mean, I know I remember when I took my first hormone shot, it was in November, 2009. Nothing, I didn't feel any differences, but the 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 holistic shift in terms of my becoming was definitely felt, you know, so that that I don't want us to minimize that. That is very, very important. Uh, and I think it goes back to that patient-centric approach to healthcare where the need for an affirmed approach by a provider comes in. But the other layer, like you're saying, because we, we're not just a single sort of um, single lens people uh, we are we, we exist in communities we exist in multiple you know societies um and so i think the the work who gets charged with this work this work has rested a lot with 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 uh, ngos previously because of a, of a very heteronormative binary sort of healthcare system that does not allow for deviation from viewing and treating patients based basically solely on surface anatomy. That's the first thing. So who, who gets charged with this work? And I guess part of the, the response to that is why we're here, why we're talking about collaborative efforts, because it's through collaboration that this work can filter through to multiple spaces, firstly. And secondly, I think um, a lot of a lot of this work hinges on educators. So, like, so, like Ron has said, it's 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 it's, it's not just the people charged with the teaching, but it's the people who who holds the who pull the the, the purse strings. It's the people who determine the policies, the frameworks, uh, uh, the dynamics of any of these spaces, and and those are operations. Those are you know management people who actually determine the pace of what is said, what is not said, how things are run and how things are managed in these settings. So, so that's a very key and critical part of it, right? And I think those then filter back to, to the primary home space because I think a lot of this work can, can find or can gain traction if it can be tied back to the primary intervention space, which should be our homes, which are linked to our primary communities, the church. I know that there are a lot of um, community uh, sort of organizations that do a lot of work uh, with the church because that is, is also another key area uh, that can be sort of reconfigured in terms of how it messages because it carries a lot of power 
and it carries a lot of presence in terms of how norms, how, how behaviors, how our social interactions happen. So I think on the one hand, we do need to still a value and, and sort of, um, you know, hold on to the work that is done by civic society organizations. But I think on the other hand, we need to find a way to trickle down this work to the primary home space. And I think that is why the location of this work, the location of these interactions becomes important because then it can be tied back to the primary caregiver, to the primary uh, sort of interactive space where, where this, these, com these conversations need to happen. Fortunately, we've got institutions like the UCT, and I'm not being biased here, that are including um, gender diversity and healthcare as part of the curriculum. I know I teach on the masters in public health, um, gender gender diversity and, and, and public health care component uh, um, of, of the taught modules. And going in there, it brings back the, 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 the social construction, the theories that are linked to how we construct and how we unpack our interactions in our primary spaces and why that should be problematized. So I think there are many uh, layers in which these interventions can happen. It cannot be a single sort of lens strategy. And I think the bulk of us who are here today are not just here for CPD points. We're here because we, we do derive a lot of sort of um, utility in doing this work. It's, it's, it's in some other format, it's tied to, to, to our purpose on, on earth. And I think in, in, in a lot of ways, even informal conversations with our peers go a long way in terms of having these, these multiple sort of avenues with which we approach how we are trying to synthesize the formalization of how we do this work. So a lot of this work happens outside the classroom. A lot of this work happens outside formal structures, uh, not taking away from that the value there, but I think also in informal interactive spaces, we, we are able to plant the seeds to, 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 to help people to think differently about how we interact on a human level and remove the lens from viewing each other purely based on our surface anatomy, which is becoming very problematic. One of um, the conversations I've had this week, and I hope I'm not out of turn for saying Pierre, I should have checked with you first, but we were speaking from, from university transformation office perspectives. How do they position themselves in terms of the messaging that they put out uh, to possible funders, donors, or whoever wants to have a relationship with a university to say, this is our position, this is our policy, this is where we'd like to see you move in terms of how you interact and include um, these dialogues and these positions in your sort of policies and how you contribute to, to these university spaces. So I think definitely it, it requires a multi-sectoral sort of approach and yeah, definitely even conversations outside the, the formal halls of learning become very critical uh, with those who have the acumen and who have the knowledge of trying to shift that lens and shift the gaze um, for, for this important work that needs to happen. I hope I've answered your question. Yes, thank you so much. It was brilliant. <laughs> thank you. Nice to see I you, see Kevin. Jonathan has a hand. Thank you, Alma. Hi, everyone, and thank you, Landa, for um, speaking. It's, it's really great to hear you speak again. Um, I think I just wanted to respond a little bit more to Pierre's comments and question. Um, so yeah, I really agree with you, Landa, around needing to support teachers, and I think I'll be presenting later on, so a little bit of a <laughs> highlight in that, but I think the need to support teachers, I think kind of, I think really what you highlight in Pierre is kind of how difficult this work is, but I think the, the emotional support and the social capital that's required to actually be able to do this work, I think really makes a big difference. And I think just to add up from, from Ron, I kind of really like that top down structure, but I think also thinking about bottom up, actually, how do we do that? And I think then speaking to the, I thought it was a theme of, of, of the symposium today, but kind of, I think also getting other parents and students involved, I think really makes a big difference. Um, yeah, I think these, um, I think also Ron was highlighting, these are continuous conversations that need to be had. So it's not just a special event, but these are ongoing conversations. But I think um, having parents having these conversations, having students or learners having these conversations, I, th I think that really makes a big difference. And I think what I found hopeful, and I think it's it maybe varies a little bit across context, but I think our current generations do have these conversations. These conversations are much more there. 
And I think sometimes, um, I think in a conversation I had earlier this week, you know, kind of thinking about something like comprehensive sexual education, um, you know, kind of sex education is a lifelong process. And I think gender diversity and gender identity come into that, but sometimes it actually is younger people educating older people. So actually, if, you know, younger people are having these conversations and taking this home, I think that does start disrupting things and start changing things. So I think, yeah, I think it's a complex picture, but I think really needing to look at multiple points of entry, but I think that's where organizing really helps. So I think like Madeleine's doing some really great work in, in the Eastern Cape, we're thinking about, you know, gender and sexuality alliances, but how do you bring multiple people together and organize in that way? And I think in school environments, I think for me, often one of the challenges is sustainability, actually, how do we, we don't just have a once-off conversation and leave it there. Um, but actually, how do we continue this? But I think we actually do need people together and to continue to meet and continue to organize and continue to have conversations. And I think that makes quite a big difference because I think then things do start start shifting. Um, I think the other thing that's really kind of struck me this year, also doing work in schools, is around representation. I don't know, there's something strange about how we talk about trans people as this foreign political concept versus actually kind of a, you know, a real, very real human being. And I think there's something, a big difference around actually doing work with trans people in the room trans people being ordinary people as part of staff bodies, as part of student bodies. Um, I think that really makes a big difference. So I think that's something that seems very simple, but I think can be incredibly powerful. For sure, definitely. And I think that's why it's always so important. I, I, I always mention how, when I started this journey, um, it's always good to see Kevin. Kevin was my surgeon. And, um, I had one narrative that, that I could try and locate myself in, which I couldn't. Uh, it was Shaz Bono's um, lived experience. Uh, besides the fact that they're from the global north, I can't find a lot of points of relatability between my narrative and theirs, right? And so I think you're right, representation is very key. And those of us who have had you know, the privilege to be um, visible, to, to, to be tied, to, to have our visibility linked to this work, it goes a long way. And that's why I'm still waiting for Madeleine's email on Wusu. Um, but it, it goes a long way. And, and, and it also, like you said, I remember Ron once mentioned how in, in some of the work that he does, Ron is gonna kill me for this. Some of the work that he does um, where young people actually assert themselves uh, with, with their sort of acquired knowledge, you know, and actually end up creating spaces where they are the ones who are leading these conversations in terms of the language, you know, um, of, 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 of inclusivity and what it should look like and what, what is going on in their spaces and how they are curating spaces for this inclusive language. So you're right, Jonathan, we should also not minimize or restrict the, the reality that young people are taking charge um, of, 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 these, ex these spaces and how exclusive they are. And they're actually reconfiguring them to make them more inclusive. And, and that's another point to leverage on. So yeah, you're right. Um, thank you for that. Thank you for, for your feedback. Uh, back to you, Alma. I think we've got one minute left. Yes, it, it, uh, it's been such a rich discussion. Um, thank you, Landa, for making us think and for everyone who contributed to, to, to the conversation. I'm so glad that we can come together to, to talk about what needs to happen um, at so many levels in, in schools and uh, um, in healthcare spaces. I see that there was a, a comment from Michelle as well that everyone needs to be educated um, at, at different levels of, of care in, in the health system. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, 